Thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, it's a really cool opportunity, and it's really cool what all of you are doing in, in the games industry. Uh, we'll start out with this, you know, who am I? Um, Jordan Walbesser, toy lawyer. Uh, this was a job uh, I didn't think that I would actually have. Um, there's not going to be a test. But there's, I started off as a computer engineer did programming, um, worked on hardware, and I ended up going to law school. And for about eight years, I did technology law, patents, um, IP, things like that. And you know, I've been a lifelong gamer. So uh, when this opportunity came up to go work at Mattel, uh, I was thrilled because all of a sudden now I get to play with toys all day instead of just making, um, you know, widgets and uh, you know, litigation and things like that. So. Uh, my background as far as what I do is in that technology space. It's in software. I do more than video game work at Mattel, but digital gaming, as we call it, is, is one of my biggest clients and one of the people that I work the most with. Um, just for to show you my street cred and to give you an idea of what type of games I like, I gave you my top three. You'll notice these are more indie games, a little bit more artsy. Uh, her story I thought was fantastic. Uh, Sam Barlow has been around for a long time. He's done some really interesting things with interactive fiction. I'm a fan. I mean, I've been playing since the Atari days. And when I started, yeah, you played Zork because that's all that there was around. Uh, another one of my favorites, top three, Return to the Obra Dinn. Uh, maybe it was the whole insurance simulator that makes an attorney very excited, but uh, I thought it'd be great game design, great, uh, great story, great plot, and uh, a, a lot with very minimal graphics, uh, which I thought was really impressive. Also very small teams, uh, you know, Sam Barlow and, and Lucas Pope, they're, they're not mega studios. Last but not least, a uh, huge fan of The Witness, Jonathan Blow, I think, is, is an excellent artist, and uh, playing through that, the work he did, the puzzles and everything is incredible. So not a lot of first-person shooters up here, but uh, I'm a little bit slower paced in my older age. So there's my gaming cred. Um, so let me talk a little bit about digital gaming at, at Mattel, and I'm just going to talk generally throughout this whole presentation. We can get into Q&A for specific things. Uh, I just want to give you an idea of what I do and what the company does. Uh, maybe some of you know this. Maybe this will be all new information for you. Uh, but the best I can do really is, is tell you my experience and my perspective from a large company. So Mattel obviously is a big company. You've heard of them. They uh, own some of the world's most popular brands, Barbie, Hot Wheels, Fisher Price, Thomas, uh, and the list, American Girl, the list really goes on and on. So Mattel's this company that has this huge IP portfolio. They sell toys, uh, they market to, uh, you know, they sell products for children, they want parents to buy these products, so there's a certain age range that we're looking for, nothing really, you know, M for mature, uh, definitely a lot on the, you know, the kids and, and maybe at the, uh, the oldest teens. Uh, but the idea is, is that as a company, we're starting to get into digital gaming. We know that this is where children are going. They're still playing with toys. They're still playing with Hot Wheels and action figures. But a lot of children have games. A lot of them have switches. Uh, and, and we know it's a huge market. We know uh, that we need to get involved with it. And we have a huge amount of intellectual property that either companies want to use or that we can use to kind of jumpstart to a really successful game. So Mattel has done things like self-publish uh, recently. We've done uh, a game called Hot Wheels Infinite Loop, uh, which has won some awards and accolades. That's a self-published game. Mattel is the, the one doing that. And of course, we've also had integrations where Mattel licenses out its technology to other, or excuse me, its IP to other companies that want to put Barbie in their game or Hot Wheels in their game or, or whatever it may be. So from an internal perspective, Mattel is not a dev studio. We're not a dev shop. We're, you know, at the end of the day, we sell physical toys. The digital gaming team is just a small part of it. But Although it is just a small part of it, there is a lot of people involved on the inside to make this work. 
even if there isn't a dedicated team of programmers to get it done. So here's sort of a cast of characters that you have all the way up from the chief franchise officer who leads the digital gaming group. Right, and that idea of that position is franchising Mattel's IP into different areas to grow the company. Uh, you have a senior director that's really calling all the shots, uh, organizing everything, making sure everything lines up. Uh, we have one business development guy at Mattel that does all the digital gaming work. Uh, great friend of mine, he's fantastic, uh, but he's the person. So. From your perspective, if you want to talk to a company, I mean, maybe other companies will be different than Mattel's, but that business development guy is usually a good person if you can get a hold of to talk to, to pitch an idea uh, for your game or for how you could use IP, whatever that may be, that's the person. And that's who we have. There's also a team of people, publishers, uh, that, that manage our, our publishing efforts on you know, the different app stores, on Amazon, on whatever it may be, uh, studio managers, producers that do more of the typical uh, game development. But from Mattel's perspective, it's more overseeing, making sure that the game that the developers are producing or you know, that another company is putting together uh, looks good, is meeting our goals, and that we're, we're doing approvals there. So there's a lot of other people behind the scenes. We have you know, community relations folks. We have um, you know, brand teams. So there, there's a lot of people that go into this. And you know, even for a company that doesn't do gaming, as its primary, uh, you know, it's its primary market. It takes a lot of people to run this. So, just an idea of that. Um, we also have to think about how do we want to release a game? How do we want to launch a game? And there's mobile and console. That's sort of how we look at it. And there's advantages to both. I'm talking about the children's market right now specifically. Mobile is the fastest growing platform that's out there. Uh, really great penetration in our target demographics. Kids are playing on phones more than they are on PCs, on PlayStations, Xbox, um, Switch is probably the, the second biggest. Uh, development costs tend to be low on mobile. Quality and you know the amount that you need to put into it tends to be a little lower on mobile. The margins are also lower. So you can't make a lot of money, well, you can't make as much money per user on a mobile game. That can be difficult because you're either ad revenue generating or you, you know, have to sell in-app purchases or actually charge for the app itself. Um, so some of those revenue models are problematic. Uh, there's a lot of people that will take cuts along the way. Google, Apple, your app stores are going to take 30% off the top. So all of a sudden that makes our our margins a lot less and if we have to pay other people, if we have to pay developers, if we have to pay uh, for third-party licensing rights, for music, for cars, whatever that may be, to Disney, who knows, it's sort of an issue as far as that goes. On the console side, uh, it's kind of interesting because w uh, Mattel can ask for what we call higher minimum guarantees and, and that's the idea that if a company comes to us and says, hey, we want to develop an American Girl game, we can say, sure, that's going to cost you a million dollars up front. And if it's on the console, they know that they're more likely to make that money back. So, you know, there's an opportunity for higher minimum guarantees in that space. Uh, development is obviously a lot more expensive. Uh, we can do, we were just talking about porting actually, I mean, we can port if something works really well on Xbox, we can put it on Switch, we can put it on PC, maybe we can put it on mobile. There's costs there, but they're reduced if we do it right. The distribution models are changing, and this has been a huge challenge because the industry just years ago, of course, was all disc-based. So you'd sell CDs at Walmart or sell DVDs at Walmart with your game on it. And then it went to digital download, which was a little more interesting, uh, a little bit easier from a manufacturing standpoint. But now we're getting into the Google Stadia, Stadia. We're getting into, uh, you know, Amazon has its own games platform, the all-you-can-eat uh, platforms that are out there. Uh, it's at Xbox Game Pass, Microsoft Game Pass for Xbox. It, all all these different things now where we have to, where we may not have thought about that five years ago, and now we have to start thinking about what that looks like now. Um, and there's also, I think, an increased 
uh, demand. I should be clear, when I'm using this word out licensing, it's sort of an industry term that we use at Mattel. That means taking IP that Mattel has, Hot Wheels, and licensing it out to a third party. So when I say that there's increased out licensing demand, uh, there's a lot more people that are interested in having bigger brand IP, the Barbies, the Hot Wheels of the world, and putting them on console. So, um, Mattel is a multi-billion dollar company. It's huge, it's international, but there's a lot of constraints that our digital teams have. One of them, of course, is budget. We're not a digital gaming company. That's not our number one priority. So the budget for our digital gaming team is, you know, not billions of dollars. Uh, it's not thousands, but, you know, we're in the millions range. So we have to be very careful and pick things that are likely going to win to maximize what we have with our budget. Another big issue for us is regulatory. So when we're making games that kids play, we have to be very careful, and that could be about collecting data, about privacy. There's so many third-party apps and third-party services that go into like a mobile game, whether or not that's doing scoreboards or tracking in-app purchases and you know all these different things that go along with it. A lot of regulatory constraints that we have to be very concerned about we have to be concerned about what ads go into a game. You know, we can't have adult ads show up in, um, in a Fisher-Price game, for example. So that's a big thing. Uh, and the other one is our audience. So not only do we have to worry about these regulatory issues, but we have to worry about the fact that these are children playing this game. You can't give Dark Souls to a five-year-old. It's not going to work. So we have to make sure that the games are... Um, appealing to children, but also appealing to their parents as well, and, uh, and that it's going to work for them. So these are all constraints that we think about when games are pitched to us or when we pitch a game and we want it to be successful. So what I'll do is I'm going to just run through the different types of deals that come across my desk. So the different kind of games, how we approach it. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics. If I talk about anything, they'll be public. So you can, you know, you can go on gameindustry.biz and, and check it out. Um, but these are kind of the different things that I come across on a day-to-day -day basis. The most common one is what I call an integration deal. So this is where we take Mattel IP and put it into an existing game. So um, for example, we've done, uh, you know, we've put Barbie the character into, um, oh, I've got to remember the name of this game. It's a, it was a dress-up app, uh, very big in Asia. So we, we licensed out the intellectual property for Barbie. We said you can use the Barbie character in this. It was for a limited time. Uh, and then it came out. So it was some, one of those like, in-app purchases kind of things. Uh, we do that with Hot Wheels as well. There's a lot of uh, car games on, you know, usually typically mobile. Although it happens in console as well, like I, there's the Hot Wheels uh, integration into Microsoft Forza uh, that has been out there where you can buy skins and cars and things like that. That's an example of an integration deal. Mattel's not doing any of the development, uh, but we do expect to own any of the derivative assets. So what I mean by that is we have to be super careful, Mattel has to be super careful about the IP that's created. So if there's a dress up app that's out there and we say yes you can use Barbie and they're making drawings of Barbie we have to make sure that Mattel owns those drawings we can't have a company out there that owns rights to our to use our brand so we're you know we're very strict about that that will kill deals and when we're working with smaller devs it can be kind of difficult because they don't understand how important that is to us and what that really means we're not asking to own the game we're not asking to own the code. We're asking to own those assets. Uh, and, and we're letting you use them, but we need to have everything back when you're done. And it also means that we can use those assets in the future. So that's where the negotiations get a little tricky. Typically, the company pays Mattel. That's usually how we want it to work. Um, I say typically because sometimes uh, Mattel has done deals where we've licensed things out for free, but there's going to be a huge marketing uh, push. So there'll be some, you know, we get something out of it typically in marketing, it'll be a lot of buzz. Uh, those are, are very atypical. Mattel will get paid sometimes just by a flat fee, like an MG, 
Uh, sometimes it's through revenue sharing, so we'll take a cut of whatever the in-app purchases are, whatever the ad revenue is for that certain time period, um, all sorts of formulas. We can be really creative there. This is where the business development guy gets involved. Yeah. Um, it depends. So it, it's, it's, just, it's a really good question, and it comes down to so many factors. Uh, part of it is like how long it's uh, um, how long that IP is going to be integrated into a game. So if it's like Microsoft Forza, we can't really take it out. Once it's out there, it's there. Um, it it really is a, a revolving door. I couldn't. I can't really give you a, an exact number. I think we've gone. I mean, it could be as high as 60%, it could be as low as 10%. It's like the deal is so variable, and, and we're never, I don't think we're ever insulted by that negotiation. It, it just so much is involved. Uh, because if there's a higher minimum guarantee, meaning you say, um, you know, I'll pay Mattel $50,000 to use Hot Wheels for a month, like, okay, that might be, that might be good for us because then there's less risk on our end. If it's a flop and you don't sell anything, then we got paid up front, and then sometimes we adjust the back end accordingly. Um, you know, to split revenue, we can have escalators that say, "Hey, you know, if you make a hundred thousand dollars, it's going to be at this percent. If it's a um, million dollars, it's at a higher percent or a lower percent, whatever that may be." So um, it's really there isn't like we don't ever come in and say, "Yep, we want our twenty seven percent." No formula. It's it's like it's amazing. Million dollar company. A lot of it sort of, you know, okay, let's let's see how this feels. Uh, but but the pressure on Mattel and on any company like is that they have very Right, right. So we want to make sure that it looks good. We want to make sure it's on brand. So it's not. It's also not just the assets, but it's also going to be the total game. I mean, if you have a picture perfect Barbie, but you're putting her into a gory zombie shooter, not cool. Like it's it's not going to look. So you know, the, there's that that type of approval process, and the team is really good about it. By the way, I mean they're right. It probably would. Yeah. And look, I've seen. I know I'm recording this. I've seen, I don't know who's doing this, but I've seen everything where people put Thomas, the, the tank engine, in like every single game. Um, and uh, I'm going to get in trouble for this. It's hilarious. It's still, it's still infringement because we're not licensing it, but it's absolutely hilarious to see Thomas in Skyrim and uh, Resident Evil. So, but that is not authorized. 
to be to be clear that it's not authorized by Mattel. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's funny. It's funny, but yeah, those are not things that we get we get paid by or authorized. And if it's someone on our team, I'm going to find out. <laughs> you know, I'm on to you. Yeah. Um, you said that uh, brand support. Um, does that also include like possible uh, like promotion? Uh, not Obviously, you know, you can't just have an app with a thousand downloads and, and look for Mattel IP. That's probably not going to work out from a business perspective, but if you're Microsoft Forza or if you're, you know, you have more leverage, yeah, there's, there's options to make things happen uh, from that standpoint, too, because both parties are aligned. these games, uh, update the games as needed if either like the relationship between us and the third party developer ends, they get bought out, or maybe sometimes you know there's companies that will do translations, um, localizations, you know we want to make sure that we can just hand them that code and they can do it quickly and efficiently. From a payment perspective, these deals look, there, there's still a lot of sliders, but they're usually bigger money deals. Sometimes Mattel will pay a developer money in advance to develop the game. So I'm, I'm just throwing numbers out here. These may not be accurate. Uh, we might say, developer, here's a million dollars. Build this game. And the idea is that Mattel will take 
don't necessarily... involved you get, like, okay, now kids are playing with little Hot Wheels toys with our logo and stuff on it, it's probably getting into a point that's closer to the trick that we would likely care about, but again, we can't go after every target, so, um, but as, as things go on, if you decided to make a game that was Hot Wheels, it was Hot Wheels, the orange track, and, you know, it was Hot Wheels branded, you'd have a serious issue with that, and then that's going to be a problem. But just mentioning something, uh, is is probably okay. It's it's probably not going to be something that um, you know that either appears on our radar or that we'd really get upset about from that perspective. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. From something to actually be like a something to rise or something to try and make a knockoff. Yeah. So. So no, so that is, if, if anything, let me help you with that. There is no set percentage. There's no like uh, 50 or this looks more like it or not. Um, it's a multi-factor test to determine. So there's infringement. So, you know, a lot of times there's going to be likelihood of confusion. Are you confused that this is a Mattel game? Are you confused that Mattel sponsored this? Um, you know, it's going to be, is it a commercial use? Is it educational? There's going to be all sorts of factors that are looked at. Um, and just because, I mean, you might have all those factors, um, you know, doesn't mean that there's not going to be a fight about it. So, um, I think, I think when in doubt, if you want to use another company's assets or it looks really similar, you, you, you just have to be careful about that because and, and this is the problem, because people do this because they want people to recognize it. They want to recognize, oh, this is Bone Shaker, which is one of, you know, Mattel's Hot Wheel cars, or it's Thomas. And, oh, we want to recognize that, and oh, maybe if I just make it green and change the face a little bit. The point is, the reason you're doing that, at the end of the day, is because you know people are recognize it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so here's, we'll put on the lawyer hat, law school hat, uh, 101. So parody, okay, so at the end of the day, is it similar to people recognizing it's Barbie Thomas? Yes. So is it an infringement? Yes. Well, 
but in the U.S. and in many other countries, we have something called fair use. So fair use does it. it fair use is a defense to infringement. So it means that yes, I took your ID and I used it, but because of these reasons, the court is saying it's okay. And parity is one of those. It's really important, not just for humor, but for public discourse that we're able to make fun of stuff because. If you're going to make fun of Barbie, there's no way that Mattel's going to be like, yeah, go for it. Sounds awesome. You know, no, we're not going to allow you to. We don't want that to happen. Parody gives you that protection. So um, there's no bright rule for what is a parody and what is not. You can go online. There's a whole bunch of court cases about this kind of thing. Like, when is it a parody? When is it not? Um, you know, if you put Barbie in a fighting game, that's probably not really a parody because it really isn't making a statement about that. If you're putting, um, you know, I don't know, maybe there's another situation where you are like robot chicken, you're definitely just making fun of it. Probably more on the parody side, but there's a risk there. So as a developer, if you do that, know that you might shake some bushes. People might be upset. So you know, maybe you get some letters about that, and then you got to be in that awkward position to either defend yourself or say, never mind, it's not worth the fight. Good question. Oh yeah. Oh yes, this is a, uh, yeah, that was a big fight. Uh, <laughs> so definitely look at, it's a good case to look into. I wasn't involved, that was before my time. Uh, that is one where Mattel sued Aqua about the use of Barbie Girl. Uh, eventually that went up to the Supreme Court. That was considered a parody. So it's a really good case. If, if this is something that's interesting to you, check out the Wikipedia article, it's solid. Um, well, so let me make sure I get this straight. I mean, Mattel owns all those properties. So if Mattel wanted to have a, uh, a Thomas the Tank engine with like Barbie in it, making fun of Barbie, I don't know why we'd do it, but we could. We own it, so we wouldn't be we wouldn't even be infringing because we own the rights to that. Does that make sense? Did I did I get that right or? that are in their 60s and they're huge they're mega fans uh, Barbie fans the same thing there's collectors so there's definitely a high range for the age but you know it's like a bell curve at some point it, it dips off so when it comes to like He-Man um, He-Man's kind of weird because the cartoon hasn't been around in 30 some years maybe more um, you could you could, but expect that you'd have to have a killer idea for it, and uh, you know, expect those fees. The you know, they'd be pretty high. So you're cut. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and well, if it was all Mattel IP, then you'd only have to do a deal with Mattel. But if you're adding in My Little Pony, then now you got to deal with Hasbro, and if you're adding in I don't know, Dora the Explorer, now you gotta deal with them. So where, where this gets, and this happens, and this, this happens, okay? So one of our big practices is um, Hot Wheels cars and licensing rights to the vehicles. So in order to do that, we have to go to every automobile manufacturer and get a license to use the name, to use the trademarks, to use the look of the car. So um, this, for games like Forza, Racing games, like this is a big part of what they do is clearing rights to the vehicles that they put in the game. Thanks yeah, of course. What have you ever had a situation where you've had your IP in a game with other companies' IPs? And then what kind of control do you mm -hmm. are you able to maintain yeah. in that when you start crossing over with different companies? Yeah, good question. We have I don't know if it's still out there. 
when I started, there was an integration that Mattel did with, I'm not going to remember the name of the developer, but it was uh, a Family Guy game. I think it was Family Guy, The Quest for Stuff. And the idea was is they wanted to use, this, this company wanted to license Masters of the Universe. They wanted to have He-Man in the game. I don't know what the game was about, but they wanted to have He-Man, a couple of like, a crossover, yeah, they wanted like, yeah, Castle, uh, Castle Grayskull. I, I, like literally, I was on the, the He-Man Wikipedia and I'm like, I can't believe this is my job. You know, and, and I'm looking up like, oh, what is the Master Sword called? Is that really what it is? Because I have to put this in a contract. In that situation, we didn't have, we had approval rights over how Mattel IEP was used. So obviously, Family Guy, content's a little bit more mature, it's a little bit more edgy, there's probably stuff that isn't like, um, you know, kid friendly in, in that game. But because we were licensing out an older age range property, we, you know, our, our thing was is we just had to have approval over how the IP was used. And the way that deal was written, like we could pull the plug at any time. If, if we just didn't approve it, then they couldn't go forward. So um, that's, that's hard because I can't write that in. There's nothing I can do in a contract to make that work. There just has to be an agreement between the brand with what they're going to allow and with what the developer wants to do in the game. And um, I try to build in like ways that, okay, you, gotta, you have seven days to do this and you have 14 days to approve that. And if we say no, reasons why, we try to, but like, I'm glad I'm not involved in those conversations because those are, those are hard. So that kind of controls what they can do with the other intellectual property they're using. If you don't like it, you just lower out. Yeah, in a, right, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's sort of how we keep control of it. But we know at some point they're we lose a bit of control when we're doing an integration like that, but you know, we, we try our best. And, and another thing we do is it's usually for a limited period of time. So it's not like a forever thing. This was, I think, for both that, that dress up game and for the quest for stuff, Family Guy. Those were maybe a month, maybe two. I think that was it. And then you could still have the items that you earned, but after that, there wasn't any way to get them. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking about more logistics about those fan things. Mm -hmm. Like, well, if you were to make a fan game that was like had premises, would be a logistical nightmare to professionally license. Like, say, have the minions and Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny all duke it out in this fighting game. Yeah. What are the chance? Like, what would your would you have those chance a, a legal chance of keeping that up if they were to target you? Uh, it'd be difficult. It'd be difficult. I think, um, I mean, maybe if there was some, if it was done in a way that was a parody, maybe you could be successful, but yeah, you... Like, as a tribute, like, it's clear. Yeah, like... Uh, yeah, how do you prove it's a parody? Yeah, proving a parody is, is really difficult. A lot of times you have to go to court, really. You would definitely have to license if it had so many detailed pieces of Mattel song. Y yeah, the... It, the structure. It would, it would be, yeah, you'd probably want to license, but even as like a fan piece, um, practically speaking, okay, practically speaking, even Disney doesn't have the money to go look for every possible infringement. So if it stays under the radar, maybe you don't get a letter, but some, some companies are pretty good at keeping track of that, and if it becomes popular, and even more if it starts making money, that's going to be a big issue, and you, you're probably going to get some letters that are not friendly, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm, like, I'm just hoping that someday I can see that dream crossover game that I've been thinking about for years. Yeah, well, hey, look, I, there's, I, when you think of racing games, that's kind of that dream. I mean, they're talking to Ferrari and Ford and GM and, you know, you name it, BMW, and all of these different cars are in the game. So it can happen, but... It would, it, take, would take, it would take a lot of effort. To it, get, it takes some work. If there's anyone that can do it, Disney can because they own half of the IP in the world anyway. Yeah, yeah way back there, yeah. So, um, same, same silver topic. Are you familiar with Mugen? Salty Bat? Uh, yeah, actually I am. So, so, so how, how is that still a thing? Yeah, that, that's because of like individual mods. Like it's not yeah. a full-fledged game. It's a game yeah. engine. It's yeah. Like so, I, I I think like two, yeah, I think two reasons. One is like, I don't, I, I think it's really under the radar, 
really, really under the radar, and it's, it's probably where, you know, a lot of the big companies will just say, we don't care, or at worst, they'll say, no, take our assets out. I bet uh, Nintendo has probably gone after them and said, no, you got to remove. And, and you know what? I bet they pop up over and over again. So it's, it's sort of a, a fight that just isn't worth fighting. But uh, you know, it's certainly an, an infringement. Maybe it's a parody, but probably, you know, yeah, probably an infringement. Yeah, so, and then uh, you next. PlayStation 2, or I'm sorry, PlayStation 1, there was a game called Tales of Destiny 2, but it was Tales of Eternia. Mm -hmm. uh, which they kept in Tales of Eternia over in the UK, but mm -hmm. not over here in the USA. You guys are, have He-Man. How come they're able to keep it over there in the UK, but not over here yet? There's a He-Man game for PS2 over in yeah. the UK, but not here. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So two, two reasons why that might happen. One is um, IP. Ownership is territorial so in nature. So Scrabble is a really interesting example of this. Mattel owns the rights to Scrabble in every country in the world except the United States and Canada. Hasbro owns it in the United States and Canada. So it's this, it, it was really weird. Again, look it up on Wikipedia. It's really weird how it came to be that way, but it did. So there's a situation where if we wanted to make a Scrabble game, we couldn't launch it in the US. We don't have those rights. Uh, so that sometimes happens where maybe like the Tales, for example, maybe you don't have the trademark rights in the UK, but you have it in the US, so on and so forth. Another reason that that might happen is simply monetary. There are markets, if you don't have a lot of money and you want to make sure you can recoup, you may not launch in Indonesia. You may launch in, you know, English, you may launch in the US, you may launch in China, you may just pick your top three that you think are going to make you some money, and, and that's it. And if things are successful, maybe you expand out and you localize in different areas, but um, you know, there's, we can look at the numbers, especially for mobile games, and we go, yeah, it's not even worth launching this in India. It's not going to work. It's not going to make us any money. So that's just for example, but that may be the reason too why some of those things happen. Uh, we'll go, um, actually, you had a question. We'll sort of go down the line here. Yeah. Sure. Um, how many attorneys are in your legal department? And Jordan, it sounds like you do a lot of transactional work. Do you also handle litigation as well? Yeah, good question. Uh, we have a, I would call it, it's a full-size law firm inside the company. So I think total we have um, over 30 attorneys. And, and this is, by the way, this is not just transactional work, deal work, but this is our corporate uh, legal, our you know immigration, our uh, labor and employment, um, the like we're publicly traded companies, so SEC, all that kind of stuff, investor relations, uh, regulatory, worldwide deals, things like that. So we've got a, a pretty solid department, and even then we go outside for. Uh, overflow work and for advice on like very specific work related to maybe movie deals or something. Um, so although I do transactional work, uh, I typically, we have a litigation group, so, um, but that doesn't mean usually that I just hand it off. Typically that means I'm involved if it, if it is going to go to litigation uh, and then we kind of work together on different things. So um, yeah, really good question. It's, I, I was surprised. I mean it's a it's like a real law firm, just inside a company. Okay. So those litigators in house, would they actually file the suit themselves, or do they do that to outside counsel? Uh, usually outside counsel. Um, they may be ghostwriting the complaints, yeah. but uh, but from a time perspective, and usually if we're going to think about this too, for a company, we're not unless we're Disney. You know, we're not excited to go to court. That's not usually what we want to do. So either it's something that's very important for us, or we're forced to go to court. So. Um, you know, in either case, defense or offense, we're going to get outside litigators involved. Just, it's just not our specialty. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great question. You had one too? Yeah? I'm going to get a sense of the corporate structure of competitors. So, Mattel, now isn't down in the East Aurora, is it Fisher Price? That's right, yeah. So, that, is that like for you? That's, that's where I am based. So, um, yeah, Mattel generally, and this is all, of course, publicly available, um, Mattel Inc exists, there's um, you know, plenty of, for international, there's a lot of other organizations, but yeah, Mattel owns, Fisher Price is its own company, and Mattel is the owner of that. So, so even though I work for Mattel, I'm based down at, at Fisher Price. That's, that's sort of my spot. Okay, and then your main competitor is at Hasbro? 
Uh, probably. I mean, um, that's one of them. I mean, there's a lot of different toy companies around. Uh, you know, Hasbro, Spin Master, uh, Jax, you name it. But, and our, our competitors, those are toy competitors, but our competitors are also Netflix and YouTube and, you know, a stick and a bat and, <laughs> and all those different things. So. You almost have like frenemy relationships with a lot of these companies? Um, the, only, the only frenemy <laughs> relationship that I've really dealt with is with, uh, is with Hasbro over the, the Scrabble thing. So um, uh, it, it gets complicated, but we're, because the industry, the toy industry is really interesting, we have to come up with new ideas every year to keep it fresh. So there's a lot of competition over that and the companies don't usually collaborate because they don't want those ideas to be shared or for someone to say that you stole our idea and for fights to break out. Those are the big toy company fights are in, in trade secret theft and things like that. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go back here. I'm trying to grab people that haven't, so yeah. Me? Yeah, you. All right, um, so where would you recommend I look to find a lawyer to help me draw um, Profit sharing and uh, royalty agreements? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So let me give you a couple options. Generally, um, you can talk to the Bar Association. They may give you some suggestions. That's probably not my first pick to where to go. Uh, you might want to talk to UB has an entrepreneurship law clinic. Um, let's see. Conflict. Uh, I'm actually an adjunct at the law school that is on that clinic, so that you know, check it out. There are, uh, <laughs> um, you know, but that, what that clinic is meant to do is, if there's entrepreneurs that need legal uh, advice, you can apply, and um, you know, and if you're accepted into that clinic, it's it's either low cost, no cost, that kind of thing. So there, there's some check that out if that's a good fit for you. Uh, Otherwise, if you got to do, um, and this is this is not legal advice. This is business advice. If you got to make something work, uh, Google's a great lawyer. Uh, I, I hate to, you know. I know. Uh, yes, I know. I mean, if look, if if a profit sharing agreement is getting between you and launching your first game that is going to make ten thousand dollars, don't spend twenty on legal. Um, a, work through it that way. If you're working with a big company like Mattel, and for whatever reason, and you're, they'll have forms. They'll give you the forms. Now, they're not going to give you legal advice, um, and there's plenty of firms around. There's a lot of firms, of course, in uh, California that have more video game focused, but there's local firms around here that do intellectual property. You, I would look for someone with expertise in like video game law, or that ha has done video games, because there's a lot involved where it helps that I'm a gamer and it helps that I have a computer engineering background and I understand the software side of things and, and how that works. So you want to find someone that has, has done these deals before. So real quick, what, if you're doing small scale stuff, doomcontract.com is literally made for just kind of more of play. Awesome. Yeah. Um, specifically game development. Yeah, and, and as, a, as a community, too, rely on each other. If you've had forms that you've had a lawyer look at, or, you know, use them, okay? You know, talk to each other and, and see if you got any ideas or you know any people. Um, that's a really good spot to look. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you. I'm sorry, I know, I know. There's a lot of people, yeah. Blue shirt. Yeah, great question. A uh, couple ways to get in touch with Mattel, any other big company. Mattel happens to have an ideas portal where you can go online. It's mymattelideas.com. You can submit a video. You can submit some description of like you know maybe an idea that you want to do, uh, and and that's one way to get it in front of the people. Uh, the most effective way, honestly, and this goes for any company. Do your homework. Go on LinkedIn. Um, if you have the opportunity to go to a show and hunt those people down. Because like, I'm, I'm thinking of, of my business development guy who I'm going to force you to do the homework on this one. 
you, you know, if you can hunt him down and you can find him online and you can you find him at a show, he's the guy that is is the gateway. He's the guy that you want to talk to. And that goes honestly for any company. If you want to talk to someone, finding their business development person is probably the main one that, that you want to go to. Email works, phone calls are better, in person is best. Licensing Expo, yeah, so like, look, our teams, they go to Gamescom, they go to um, CES, they go to E3, they never invite me, I'm mad about it. Uh, they, uh, you know, but all the, you know, PAX, uh, you name it, if, you know, they, they are looking and they are hungry to find opportunities to license out, to license our IP to games that are gonna make us money. And they're looking for opportunities maybe to work with developers and find developers that can make games and to find service providers that can service our games. So um, it's definitely out there. Yes? How expensive is it to like, license a Mattel IP or to use it as an asset other than my game? Um, <laughs> it, it is, yeah, you know what? I don't even have a range. Yeah. And here's why, because it, it all depends on, on the synergy. So if you, got, like, if you got a game and you can convince someone on the marketing team that it would be awesome to have Thomas in this game, like I've run across deals where we've done it for free. But the expectation, by the way, is that millions of people are going to see it. And, and it's going to have like a really positive effect and we're going to go trumpet it and put it on uh, social media and do all this. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you show up and you're like, yeah, I want to go put he-man in my fighting game and you're going to sell 10,000 copies uh, you know it, it, you may not get so high of a reception but um, there's really not a there's really not a range because it's not usually just a hard cost uh, it, it's you know sometimes it's profit sharing sometimes it's up front it, it can be anything but uh, um, what Mattel and any other company that owns IP is looking at is how can they make money so and and is it worth their time because I, I will be angry if I'm doing deals that are like three thousand dollars and I have to write a big contract to make it it's not worth our time I think the expectation is you you got to be at least in that five digit range you know where you're going to be making money where you're going to be able to say to Mattel hey we're going to make you fifty thousand dollars if you do that that means from your perspective for how much money your game has to make. You know, do the math. Yeah. So you mentioned always searching for ideas and such, and we have the ideas portal. I'm sure it's full of many well-intentioned individuals and <laughs> interesting ideas. Um, but typically when things, even on the hardware and toy side, mm -hmm. uh, people approach with ideas that actually move forward um, on the successful sides, so like what level of Prototype, uh, um, or they are actually accept, accepting kind of like the pie in the sky without an execution. Yeah, there's like for hardware, and even so, for hardware, it's a little bit different. I think they want to see a proof of concept. That's probably the minimum. If you have an idea, um, like for a board game, or we, we call those just regular games, like, yeah, maybe, well, it's probably cheap enough to have a proof of concept anyway, but. Um, you know, when it comes to mechanical things, yeah, they want to see, it doesn't have to be perfect. They just want to see that it can do what you're, you're saying. And I think we ask for a video. And that kind of weeds out those deals that are not, like, you know, are well-intentioned but not that good. Yeah, yeah, when it comes to a digital game, that's probably the case. Um, you know, but there are, but it, it depends, I think, on, on what you got to do. But the, it's a lot easier for the brand teams to look at a concept and say, oh, yeah, we could do this. Because they have ideas, too, that they want to make work. So it might spark them. Oh, yeah, man, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wish I knew. I, so I don't have a lot of information specifically on the Power Glove. I'm going to look tomorrow because now I'm curious. Um, but 
How it works with inventors typically, so we have a whole department that does inventor relations and if you come up with an idea and we put it into a product and um, you know the numbers I've seen and, and I'm not going to say what is typical and what is not, I've seen as high as 10%, I've seen as low as like 1% or even half a percent but it all depends on what it is. If it's like um, you know, a small piece of an action figure, maybe it's on the lower end. On the digital side, it's kind of interesting because we're just getting into this where people are have ideas for digital games and we're trying to figure out what that royalty percentage looks like. Um, those are on the higher end. I think the industry standard for an idea for a digital game, yeah, you could fetch yourself 10% possibly. No. The argument is, is that 10% of gross or profit? And there's a lot of ways to calculate that. And we're not trying to, you know, we're, we, um, and this is important for the games, or for the toy industry. We need inventors. We need happy inventors. So, like, yes, it is confrontational and it is a real negotiation. But at the same time, Mattel and other toy companies are not looking to screw over the inventors. If they did that, they'd be out of business because every year they need new ideas. If you make those inventors unhappy, they're not coming back for round two. They're going to another company. So we, we try to be fair by them. Um, if I submitted, you're talking about ideas. Yeah. If I submitted, say, a board game or a toy, yeah. nothing digital, um, using that portal, yeah. um, what's the turnaround time that they would actually be a physical product? It, it could be pretty quick, um, you know, especially for like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, within a year. I mean, we do pretty quick turnarounds. The games group, like Uno, for example, we do pretty quick turnarounds for for products. So if we get a license where we want to do like Friends Uno, we can probably turn that around in a couple months. Um, for a completely new game, it might be years. There might be a lot of back and forth. and. And by the way, they're doing testing the whole time. So if you have a game and, I mean, they're the ones going out internationally and saying, hey, does this work? Beta testing this. Can we make sales? What does Walmart want to sell this at? How are we going to make money on it? So there's a lot of work that actually goes into creating a successful product. But you're probably looking at anywhere between six months to two years. Now, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know or might be asking, do you guys, uh, I'm assuming you manufacture most of your stuff in China? Uh, no, we have a really diverse uh, supply chain. So, like, is there stuff in China? Totally. Uh, but uh, all sorts of different countries in the Pacific Rim, Mexico, uh, and even in the U.S. So, in, in fact, Uno, for example, when we want to do a real fast turnaround, it's done here in the U.S. Because we know we can get it done. Small batches, things like that. So, it's literally all over the world. Okay. Cool. Um, let's do, because I don't want, like, I've gone on for an hour, so uh, maybe we'll, we'll call it here and then I'll be happy to stick around later. Yeah, rock on. <laughs>